conversations but the next but the next um main uh year when it did come up in conversation was in 2013 uh as part of the Warsaw International Mechanism for Loss and Damage which was established at COP19 um this was basically intended to support vulnerable countries by promoting the implementation of approaches to loss and damage um there was an entire proposal that was set up it, there was a lot of discussion that went around it but it was eventually watered down and no specific financial mechanism was actually agreed upon that year um then moving on to the paris agreement which was signed at cop 21 um it included a specific article on loss and damage but there was nothing explicit in creating any sort of legal obligations regarding loss and damage so there were again discussions there about loss and damage but nothing concrete actually came about so many proposals were being made uh but the richest countries um also those with the the highest historical greenhouse gas emissions they refused to meet the demands of actually setting up a specific loss and damage fund um and that kept on happening up until last year on the final day of cop 27 when the decision to establish a loss and damage fund was finally taken so um finally after multiple years of discussing this uh cop 27 they finally decided okay yes we do need a loss and damage fund and let's uh go forth and set it up next slide so this is a little bit more context of the loss and damage fund um so over 30 years ago the alliance of small island states they were the first ones to call for the creation of an international financial mechanism uh to compensate the most vulnerable small island and low lying coastal areas for the rising sea level as a result of climate change um the the small island states basically uh, argued and said that they are not the ones that are contributing towards high levels of uh, greenhouse gas emissions yet they are the ones that are facing uh, you know major weather events and um, issues related to climate change and so they should be compensated for it and yeah like i said uh, that the request to establish such a mechanism went unheeded uh, up until last year when the eu decided to uh, back the decision lended its support and the the request to create a loss and damage fund was finally made because it was on the very last day of cop 27 uh, other than deciding on the fact that yes we should have this fund there were no other details that were decided upon um so in the interim they decided to keep a transitional committee um and the main role of this transitional committee was to provide recommendations for adopting this fund clarifying any uh, details such as like who will be contributing to this fund um the eligibility criteria for the vulnerable countries that will receive these funds um and just basically deciding the overall overall uh, procedural organization of like how this fund will actually work So the loss and damage fund is basically an international financing mechanism where vulnerable countries are compensated for facing the negative consequences of climate change for which they have contributed the least amount to and the main motivation to have a fund like this is to basically pool in financial resources into this loss and damage fund and these financial resources will not just come from uh, the public sector of like uh, countries in the global north uh but also bring in funds from the private sector bring in fund from uh, multilateral organizations from development banks um so that they have this big pool of financial resources uh that can be then transferred on to vulnerable countries that are facing these massive losses and damages uh due to um, major weather events next slide um so now a little bit about why this fund is super important uh the main thing is that the true cost of natural disasters is very difficult to accurately measure and comprehend in in most cases what actually ends up happening is that uh smaller vulnerable poorer countries um they they overestimate these costs whereas richer countries who actually have uh historically high greenhouse gas emissions um underestimate these costs and then there's an imbalance between that so the, it's it's very difficult to accurately measure and decide which one is correct 
Um, poorer countries are the ones that experience exacerbated impacts on livelihoods and families because the, the cost of natural disasters, it doesn't just include infrastructure loss, uh, but job losses, livelihood destruction, biodiversity impact, and so on. And these costs, they can't be underestimated anymore. So for poorer countries, it's it's very, very difficult. Nations that are like extremely vulnerable to climate risk are often the ones that actually don't have the funds to even have mitigation measures in place. Uh, they don't have the money to have flood defense systems in place or early warning systems in place um, so that they can actually like manage the, the extreme weather events that they might face. They, they have a limited budget. Um, their governments have a limited budget, which they have to distribute towards housing, towards education, nutrition, agriculture, healthcare, etc. And when they are struck with a major calamity, they end up having to pull resources from these different areas um, to then mitigate the effects of climate change that their, their, their country is facing. Mm -hmm. a, a, a really good example of this is the uh, the, ca the catastrophic floods that were happening in Pakistan, which basically left a third of the country submerged and numerous people homeless. Um, I'm sure you guys must have like read up in the news about it uh, and everything. But in, in situations like that, like countries like Pakistan, they do not have adequate systems in place to manage the losses and damages that they're facing uh, because of these extreme weather events. Um, and in, in such a case, like the, the financial costs of rebuilding and recovering from those floods actually ran in the billions. So that's the amount of money that, you know, vulnerable countries don't have. And what they end up doing is then borrowing from other countries or depending on, uh, you know, multilateral uh, organizations or development banks uh, to kind of like help them rebuild and recover from uh, those major events. So in essence, small vulnerable countries and communities are actually disproportionately being affected by climate change while contributing the least to it. Next slide. Um, so like I said, uh, this fund, the, the, the transitional committee is still working on uh, the details of this fund. And hopefully uh, at this year's COP28 in Dubai, uh, they will work towards operationalizing this fund um, and uh, understanding like how they can move forward in actually making this loss and damage fund, not just something that's on paper, but an, uh, a reality. Uh, however, with the current information that we have and the current uh, conjecture that is there around loss and damage, there are a lot of shortcomings that this fund currently faces. The number one thing being a vague definition. So the term loss and damage, it lacks a precise definition of what exactly loss and damage means um, because it can have varying interpretations for different stakeholders. For example, uh, the biggest arguments that we have seen, which has actually delayed the process thus far of actually having a loss and damage fund set up um, was that uh, richer countries uh, did not um, agree to certain uh, events or certain um, countries uh, uh, talking about loss and damage or saying that they're facing these losses and damage because of climate change. Um, whereas vulnerable countries uh, were very much stead on on the fact that no, this is because of you. This is because of the uh, greenhouse gas emissions that you are still doing. And it's not us. We are not the ones that have actually been contributing to climate change as much as you have. And so we do need to get compensated. Um, so that varying definition and varying interpretation of loss and damage has created a lot of uh, confusion. So that is one of the biggest shortcomings uh, at this point of this fund. And the other thing is it does not provide a clear description of um, what sort of economic and non-economic losses um, are included in this specific term. Um, is it just infrastructure loss? Um, is it just job loss, just livelihood loss? Or does it also extend out further um, to loss of culture, loss of um, uh, mental uh, the effect to mental well-being of the people that live in these uh, climate vulnerable nations. Um, so it's important that we include all aspects of this. Um, and it's also important that we figure out ways and agree to certain ways in which we can kind of measure these uh, losses. And they are also incorporated in this uh, definition of loss and damage. Uh, the second most important point is unclear guidance. Um, currently, there are a lot of questions regarding 
how this fund will be overseen um, regarding the functioning of this fund, um, about who, uh, how the money would be dispersed or to whom would it be sent and um, who would end up contributing to it. Um, there's no specific list of uh, countries that have been told that, you know, these countries need to be putting in funds, uh, these countries need to be financing this loss and damage fund, or uh, no responsibility has currently been given to the private sector or to the development banks uh, to kind of pool in resources. Um, it's a lot of just conjecture at this point of time where they're saying that, yes, we need to take this responsibility. Yes, we need to do uh, um, our part. However, there is no specific list and there is no specific um, answer to like who will contribute and which are the vulnerable countries that can access uh, <clears throat> excuse me, these funds. And so like deciding on uh, these smaller details will be extremely crucial to operationalizing this fund eventually. Next slide. <clears throat> Next is the absence of standardized procedures. So again, uh, there's there's a lot of debate on like deciding what how they want to like uh, decide on the functioning of this uh, fund. Currently, there are no benchmarks or procedures that are like set in place. Uh, this can like hinder the ability to assess the implementation of the fund, and it's very important that we have these set in place so that we can understand whether this fund is actually working, whether it is set up for the purpose, um, and it is fulfilling that purpose. So there are a lot of questions regarding what might constitute a disaster that is sufficiently large to trigger payments. Uh, is it only going to be a major weather event, um, or does uh, does it also include slow onset events? Does it also include rising sea level? rising temperatures um also what sort of damages might qualify um like are harder to value natural ecosystems or cultural assets like damage to 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 those areas are they also going to be considered uh while we're talking about loss and damage and then finally the biggest thing is the delays due to disagreements um in the past couple of months the transitional committee has met uh, multiple times to uh, discuss the issue of loss and damage and discuss the operationalization of this fund. Um, and sadly, there have been some breakthroughs, but not that many. Uh, there have been a lot of like debates and discussions, and there have been times when um, countries have left the meetings earlier, and they have not decided to like sit there and negotiate and discuss on how they can actually work towards operationalizing this fund. So, and it's since it has taken so long to establish this fund, like it it's mainly because of the disagreements among wealthier nations in the global north regarding reparations and accepting responsibility for the uh, climate change that they have caused. And if these delays continue and this fund does not get operationalized this year, then it will be extremely detrimental uh, and it will set us back way further um, where we won't be actually able to achieve a lot of our climate goals, which we need to um, in order for us to all stay alive and survive on this earth. <laughs> um, next slide. Um, so here are some suggestions uh, to address some of these shortcomings. The number one thing, again, being identifying a precise definition of loss and damage and a clear specification of the countries that are responsible for providing the funds and the vulnerable nations that will receive assistance. And um, along with a clear specification of the countries that are responsible for providing funds, it, it also will now include the private sector uh, because they are also being included in the conversation regarding this, uh, along with other major banks like the World Bank and like their specific projects that they have that are catered specifically towards climate action. Um, the the ecosystem for climate finance is so complex and diverse that uh, it's it's important to understand who are the parties that are responsible for actually financing this fund and also a list of the nations that will receive this assistance so that we actually know that uh, it's not just like money lying in a fund, uh, but it's actively being used by vulnerable countries that need this money to then recover and rebuild. Uh, the next point is conducting research to incorporate not only the financial costs of climate change, but also the non-economic losses and damage uh, relating to culture, lives, and the mental well-being of individuals residing in countries prone to climate risk. So this is, again, reiterating the same point that I said uh, previously, where you know it's important to include like both aspects. You cannot just look at the financial costs and call it a day. Um, again, because 
the the way that we measure those costs is is varied and so understanding that uh loss and damage uh costs uh, need to include both these aspects is very very important and the next point is developing transparent comprehensive data driven procedures to ensure the accountable evaluation and distribution of funds to vulnerable nations um this point is especially important because um the average person reads the newspaper reads the headline list sees um everywhere on the news that okay canada has pledged 5.3 billion dollars to uh combating climate change but how is that 5.3 billion dollar like divided has it been um earmarked to different funds has that money then actually been transferred has it gone to those vulnerable nations to those vulnerable communities so there needs to be more transparent comprehensive data driven procedures in which we can actually make sure that there's like accountable evaluation and distribution of these funds so that we can see that they're actually going to uh the the countries um that need them the most and on an urgent basis um if i wasn't uh someone who was you know like actually researching this topic and reading more about it and understanding more about it um i would you know just be like the average person just reading the news and being like okay yeah well you know canada is doing quite a bit so that's it like you know we have done our part right but um it it just doesn't end there so we have to do our part in trying to like understand that okay the pledge has been made but has it actually resulted in something or not next slide um the next point is like an increased engagement and dialogue with local climate actors including government officials activists civil society organizations and communities this is another really important point that along with transparency there has to be inclusion of different voices um it's it's important that we like bring in like different uh, actors different like uh, parties that um are involved in the discussion regarding climate change and climate finance in particular climate finance is something that is considered to be like very like niche and like not a lot of people like talk about it or understand it because it is a little bit of a complex issue but if we don't bring in different voices it's very difficult to kind of come up with solutions that actually will effectively work um instead of just having the top government officials of like different countries just sitting on a table and bickering amongst each other and trying to like figure out like what they need to do or like what sort of solution they can come up with they need to have increased engagement and dialogue with uh, different parties to understand uh, what sort of solutions can actually work and the next point is to push for fundamental changes within climate finance systems to guarantee that funding reaches local communities of vulnerable nations in a timely manner uh this is again extremely important because the climate finance system is super complex there are already different uh climate funds that are set up the different climate projects that are like currently occurring in developing nations um there needs to be more transparency there needs to be more urgency in uh, regarding specifically the loss and damage fund so that when vulnerable nations are uh facing such issues when they are uh in in a deep crisis they are able to access these funds in a really timely manner and then lastly urging local government officials to prioritize the interests and needs of vulnerable communities and make more substantial contributions towards the loss and damage fund i think this is another uh, really important point because currently pledges have been made towards different climate funds uh in the past um and they have run in like millions but if we look at the research if we if we look at the research and if we see uh the uh um the statistics and the data we'll see that the the amount uh, of uh, losses and damages that like countries are facing due to climate change runs into the billions and trillions so it is very very crucial that countries make more substantial contribution towards the loss and damage fund and take it as uh, seriously as they have other climate funds in the past and continue their uh, their work towards uh, fighting climate change next slide so finally um yep time is of the essence when we're talking about climate change uh and currently we are not close to achieving the target of uh limiting global temperature increase to 1.5 degrees celsius uh which was outlined in the paris agreement 
Um, and yeah, researchers have estimated that the economic consequences uh, from loss and damage related to climate change will rise up to um, $500 billion by 2030 and could potentially escalate to $1.7 trillion by 2050. Um, and I mean, 2030, we're in 2023, 2030 is just seven years away. And so at this year's COP28 in Dubai, it is extremely crucial that nations collaborate with each other and they finalize the operationalization of this loss and damage fund. Uh, because if they don't, then it's, it's going to set us back. And uh, we unfortunately will not be able to achieve our targets in time. So it's extremely important that we like continue this conversation on loss and damage and, uh, you know, like uh, people educate themselves about what climate finance is, what loss and damage is, and they keep urging their government officials and they keep talking about these uh, um, issues so that they can push for some change. Um, so, yeah. So next slide. Yeah, so with that, we come to the end of my presentation. Um, and yeah, I would like to now open it up for like any questions or comments anybody has uh, regarding any uh, thing in the presentation or just about the topic of loss and damage in general. Um, I know for me, I did not know so much about the climate finance space before I actually started doing my research in it. And I can understand that it's a very complex topic and it's it's uh, it's a lot of information to take in in just like a short span of time um but uh, yeah if you have any questions comments um any thoughts about this uh, i would love to hear that i have a question yep it's brian Dunphy. um <laughs> I'm just curious about, I mean, there's a lot of wrinkles, obviously there's a lot of mountains to climb um, to get this to, to some kind of a start line, forget about a finish line. Um, what does China's, China maintains that they're a developing country, which is obviously a huge sticking point considering they're now the uh, second largest, if not first, the largest economy in the world. How does that, impact these discussions and getting COP28 to actually produce something useful? Is it a major roadblock, not a major roadblock? Can things get done without solving that issue with China? There's still a lot of discussion happening regarding that uh, topic as well. And that, again, it boils down to the fact that countries keep discussing about the fact that, okay, they, they consider themselves to be a developing nation, but they do have the money, so they should be contributing to this loss and damage fund. And um, with them arguing with the US and asking the US to basically take accountability and responsibility for uh, compensating vulnerable nations, that has been, uh, I would say, like a point of contention which has again resulted in the fact that there hasn't been like a concrete decision made on like, okay, who is going to be providing those funds? Who is going to be um, uh, financing this loss and damage fund? So it's still like in the transitional committee meetings, it's still something that they are discussing. It's still something that they're like optimistic about. Um, and in the meantime, with discussions regarding loss and damage, they're also trying to figure out, okay, what can be our alternatives? What can be, uh, what can we uh, do, which is not specifically, you know, putting ourselves in, uh, in, in that position where, where we're saying that, okay, we'll take accountability because that's, that's another part of the, of the loss and damage um, conversation where countries don't actually want to take accountability for uh, the climate change that they have caused. So they are now looking towards like alternative ways or alternative ways to kind of, shape that conversation and say that okay we will provide the funds but not as much as you're asking and not in the specific way you're asking but we'll actually do this whereas vulnerable countries and like countries in the global south are um like really pushing towards no like if you've decided on this last year like we need to stick to it so it's actually just a matter of time to see that what those discussions actually have yielded anything or not and how that will play out in cop 28 um there's still like i was hoping that at least by this time there would be something concrete that would come out of the meetings with the transitional committee 
um but there hasn't been as much like movement in that area as i mean i would have hoped for mm -hmm. i mean sort of a follow up so in, in essence we're not sure how much of a roadblock just the china piece is um, yeah it's it is but, a roadblock for sure but how much is it like the main thing I, I wouldn't say like it's the main thing but it is a point of contention for sure at the risk of stealing time others might have questions um cop 28 is coming up fast so i mean even one of your slides are at, i i jot down something but um the, the need for transition for transparent data driven comprehensive um, allocation procedures, et cetera. I mean, that sounds like, forget all the other uh, problems um, that exist in getting nations to work together on something so massive. I mean, that alone sounds like a heck of a mandate to get done in time for COP28 to really give the meaningful, decisive finishing, you know, end statement. Is that, I mean, are, are is there anyone that's positive about outcomes in COP28 or most people in the know, and I'm not in the know, um, pretty pessimist? Um, I think at this point, so like some of the things that I was discussing, I was talking about is like, okay, in an ideal world, we would want all of these to be done. We would want all of these conditions to be fulfilled uh, by COP28, but um, don't live in an ideal world and it's very difficult to get nations to agree on a lot of different things so at this point i think the focus is more on pushing towards the operationalization of uh, a fund like this or uh, a fund similar to this or some sort of mechanism that can address loss and damages and even if they cannot check all the boxes they check some of them or most of them so that they can actually start moving in that direction um, and they don't delay it by another year. Because if if in this year's COP28, they just keep, again, bickering and discussing and delaying everything else, then it'll like set us back by another entire year where they'll keep having like conferences in the middle. But arriving at some sort of a concrete decision, which maybe fulfills a couple of these things, is important to keep that momentum going, um, just so that we have something that we are like actually looking forward to and can like push for more change in the future. Um, for now, if you have to ask me personally, I don't think that they will agree to all things. There's just no way that like that ideal situation can can work out. If it does, it'll be great. But for now, it seems like even if they can fulfill a couple of them, it'll still be, you know, something that's it's a step in the right direction. Like how how it was celebrated last year when on the final day that they actually agreed to establish such a fund everybody was like super excited and they were like yes like finally after so many years of discussing this topic they have finally agreed to establish the fund so i think that was considered a step in the right direction it's just like okay now you need to keep taking more steps and keep walking and then keep running and moving towards actually doing something uh, yeah so you, you walked a fine line there but i think your heart is saying that we're not going to get something major happening in COP28 by the end. Yeah, I'm I'm hoping, I'm keeping my fingers crossed that there is something that does happen. Um, but with the current discussions with the transitional committee, uh, that there's just been a lot of uh, unclear information of just like, is this even moving forward? Or like, how are they moving forward? Have they decided on a lot of things or not? Like, especially the ones that like I, I discussed where I was just like, okay, these are the current shortcomings of this fund. Like these details need to be given to us. Like if, if this fund needs to be operationalized. So I'm hoping that they do have at least part of those details set and ready uh, and part of those specifications set and ready um, so that they can continue talking more about it. Mm -hmm. Very interesting stuff, by the way. Um, so glad I jumped on. Yeah, if anyone else has any questions, also just keep in mind that questions don't necessarily have to be a follow-up. If you have any clarifying questions, questions as well, those are very welcome. Maybe other people have the same confusions as you. You want Yashri to clear up something. I mean, she is definitely very knowledgeable about the subject. So while you have her here.
Also, um, feel free to put them in the chat if you don't want to unmute. That's also very welcome. Sorry, I just have one little tiny question. Um, Canada joined Denmark and Germany and one or two others in terms of creating a fund. Am I mistaken that it was really only earmarked for biodiversity, given that there's all these other multiple necessary categories? Was it just biodiversity, our fund, the allocated fund? Um, there is an allocated fund, which is called the Global Shield. I don't know if that's the one that you're looking at. Um, that was proposed by Germany uh, last year. And uh, Canada has decided to be a part of that as well and like put funds forward for that. That also uh, um, addresses loss and damages, but it does so in a different way. It's more of like um, like an insurance scheme. So it basically asks uh, vulnerable countries or like countries that are facing loss and damages to put in funds into that uh, global shield fund. And then eventually when they do need it, they can take it back. Um, countries are arguing and saying that, well, why should we put the money in it in the first place? Like we're not the ones like creating this uh, like climate change. We're not the ones that are uh you know like we're not we're not doing any of this so then why are you even asking us for this money like it's you who needs to be compensating us and so so with that like there's there's a discussion uh in global uh with the global shield regarding that so it's still again a, a mechanism to be addressing loss and damage and everything but um how well will that work and again, be operationalized. That is also something that's been like, uh, been discussed and th there's been like talks of that, like working around the background as well. Uh, and there have been like countries like al al along with Canada that have like pledged like millions to that a specific fund. Um, so that is an another aspect of like addressing loss and damages, not in the specific way that the countries in the global South had expected, but still some way that it's happening. Okay, that's interesting. Thank you. Yeah, so there are some interesting questions in the chat. I'll just read out the first one and Yashi, if you'd like to hop on. So in terms of private companies that could also provide funds, is there any information about what type of private companies? Are we talking Amazon or something else? Yeah, so private companies, I would say Yes, there are like a lot of like these major like um, I would say like tech companies, investment companies uh, that have a lot of money that uh, there are some companies that specifically invest in setting up, um, you know, solar power plants and everything in like developing countries. So they have like specific projects that are earmarked towards like building like mitigation systems or adaptation systems in place. Um, the way to kind of leverage the massive amount of money that they have is to understand that like they won't invest in a project or they won't invest in a fund where they don't see any profit coming because it's a for-profit organization. So there needs to be an effort being made on the part of governments um, in the, on the part of the public sector to incentivize them to understand that this is also their responsibility. So the number one way is that they like invest in like um, environmental projects and mitigation uh, systems and adaptation systems and put in funds for this loss and damage fund that we're talking about. And the other way is to uh, also understand that they have to, they keep saying this phrase phase down, but uh, phase down, but it's also now important to move to the point of phasing out fossil fuels um, and the usage of fossil fuels. So a lot of the, uh, like the bigger uh, private companies need to kind of do their part in that. So it's like twofold and there there needs to be like more effort to like incentivize them to be a part of this conversation because currently like just asking the public sector to like cough up enough funds, like 
the way we are thinking of like where these funds will come from like people will say that oh they'll increase our taxes um and so we don't want to pay more taxes in order to like help uh, some country that you know we don't live in uh, right so that conversation needs to be brought more to like your home like more local level where you actually feel the need to be a part of this conversation that it is important that you put in funds uh, so that this can actually help globally and not just specific countries or specific communities that is not just helping them out but is helping everybody out um because if we just look at the money that like is generated i guess like i don't know from like financial companies in the wall street like if they alone decided to fund this like it would be great but uh, they're not going to do that so we have to kind of force them to do that yeah that would be like ideal but we definitely need some incentive that way because why would they do that on their own <laughs> yeah but okay yeah so then the next question we also have is do you have any ideas of effective ways we can advocate for working out the details of the loss and damage fund on a more local level apart from Dan the Hill? Yeah, um, yeah, that's a great question. Um, yeah, loss and damage, I would say definitely like you can bring it down to a, a more local level where you can have discussions regarding this topic with, you know, like a lot uh, like people in your community with like climate activists or the actors who are actively involved in the discussion regarding climate change um, again because there's a lot of uh, there, sometimes there's not a lot of like discussion regarding climate justice climate finance climate debt um, and that's a very big aspect of tackling climate change so the number one step actually in but that you can do at the local level is to educate yourself about this is to understand like you know like what this exactly means and how you can actually like do something about it um and so loss and damage being ewb's like policy focus um i will now sit and plug in our other series that's also happening um next week is our um a specific policy ask and like the work that we can do in like advocacy on the local level and everything so we're, we're trying to break the bigger topic of loss and damage down to um like specific areas that we can actually like do something about like more actionable items so yeah so that that'll be something that'll be like an ongoing discussion that we will keep having and that we will love like um input from all of you of like what you think would be the most effective way of uh, um bringing this topic down to uh, to a more local level um and yeah dinoja has uh, posted that in the chat so that's our first policy development session um it's it's going to start next week so it would be great if you guys sign up for that and attend those sessions as well um because we want to have a more interactive uh, conversation about what we can do and uh, what are the more uh, act actionable ways that we can actually make a difference so please sign up I'll also send the uh, sign up in an e email after this. So in case you guys missed in the chat, but it is in the chat right now. So that's convenient. Um, yeah, and I also want to open up in case anyone wanted to discuss just policy in general at EWB. How do we choose the policy focus and maybe areas you'd like to see focused on in, in next years? Does anyone have any ideas on that? Different areas you'd like to see us focus on basically. Sorry, there was one more question that I received. I just saw it. Um, and it said that you mentioned that we need to encourage people in power to take action. Could you elaborate on this? Is this to keep pressure on attendees of COP28 to increase funding for loss and damages? Um, yes, essentially, yes, uh, that they do need to increase funding for loss and damages and also find ways to involve uh, the private sector. Um, also find ways to basically increase that pool of financial uh, resources so it's it's extremely important to build that pressure on like your government officials on uh, the attendees of cop 28 so that they understand that we understand that this is a very important issue and that we are fully advocating for it and that we fully understand that this this needs to happen now that you create a sense of urgency because without that there won't be any like action that will be like taken so till the time they don't understand that the that the public understands this that the public even cares about this uh th there there's a high chance that it will again get delayed and it will be a point of disagreement again
sorry, quick question. Your PowerPoint presentation, is that going to be made available or is it already on a drive? I can email it out afterwards. Oh, that would be awesome. Thank you. Yeah, for sure. That's a great idea. Okay, I'll just ask if anyone else has any last minute things to discuss or anything else to ask, but otherwise we can wrap it up pretty soon. Okay, yeah, I think we can finish a little bit early, but thank you so much, Ashri. Honestly, like I learned a lot and I'm sure everyone else did too. It was awesome to hear your insights of this topic and I'm excited to learn more after this. I'll be sending out more resources for everyone who is interested. And I'm also gonna send out yeah, the PowerPoint, the sign up for the sessions next week. And just as an update for our summer advocacy series, we won't be having an event the very following week. So next week, but we will continue the week after that. The sign up for that will be posted at a later date, but it'll be on Discord, Instagram, LinkedIn, I'll email it. So you'll hear about it, but just keep your eyes posted. And, and that's it. Thank you guys so much for coming out and I hope to see you at the next one. Thank you, Ashley, again. Yeah, thanks everyone. Thank you both. Bye.